In part one of our 1066 series, we wargamed the Battle of Fulford Gate, a critical but often overlooked engagement that kicked off one of the most consequential years in English history. I played as Harold Hodrada, the Viking King of Norway, against my son Wyatt, who defended the city of York in Northumbria. My army emerged victorious, matching the historical outcome and setting the stage for the second great battle of 1066, Stamford Bridge. In today's episode, we'll invite Professor Kelly DeVries to explain how this unusual battle took shape. And then I'll come face to face with the Saxon pretender, Harold Godwinson. Which club member will that be? And what will happen when our armies collide at Stamford Bridge? Find out now on the season four premiere of Little Wars TV. Stamford Bridge has, has been studied. I just re recently read another dissertation that was uh, that was written on Stamford Bridge. Problem is that we have to go with a lot of uh, sources that are written a lot uh, afterwards and are in fact written as sagas. So already the uh, historical worth is is somewhat questioned. I'm Kelly DeVries. I'm the professor of history at Loyola University of Maryland and historical consultant at the Royal Armouries in the UK. Harold Godwinson is brilliant in moving that army to the north and getting up there quickly. And there's no doubt that Harold Adrada does not think he's going to be there anytime soon. He knows that he's coming. He knows that would be the case after the armies of Northumbria, Mercia, the militias have been defeated. But uh, he doesn't know how quickly he gets there. He will see him in the distance. So Harold um, Camp is up on, these, uh, on this uh, hill, so he could see him in the distance, and he sees this cloud, and, and the Norwegian King Saga says, and initially he doesn't have any clue what this is. He just sees dust coming out of the, out of the distance. He's, uh, he's been so, um, so carefree that he's allowed uh, at least a third of his army to go across the river and, and sunbathe or play, um, swim in the river. Uh, they seem to have had a lot of uh, fun. They left all their armor back in camp and so forth and so on. And that part is still caught. He doesn't have enough to even get them across the bridge. Now, the bridge is narrow. Later on, there'll be this big heroic idea of a, a, a and, and this is recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle as well, that there's a sole Norwegian who stands in the bridge with his ax and he kills everybody, comes across. He has to be disemboweled from below. This is why we know it's a wooden bridge. Disemboweled by a, below by a, an Anglo-Saxon uh, sol soldier who will sneak below and stab him in the groin. Uh, but, uh, and, and that allows some, uh, allows at least Harold Andrada, the remaining two thirds of the army, to get its uh, armor on and to, to form a shield wall as a defensive structure. So they're still now a formidable foe, foe for Harold Godwinson. But at the same time, they're depleted and now they're demoralized. Uh, and some of them don't have their armor. Some of them have, uh, have been running up from the river, obviously, to join the shield wall. And, and uh, Harold Godwinson recognizes how powerful a force it is, so he tries. He himself will go forward, and that's when we get a real disputes about how the sagas tell us that there were that the English had a lot of, of cavalry and they lured them back in a way that William will do the same in Hastings. Uh, so a lot of people doubt this version. I'm not entirely certain one way or another, but it does seem that the shield wall that the Norwegians build eventually gets broken. One of the things that's really strange is we know that uh, Harald Hodrada has um, troops still down at his ships, and they're not that far away, about 23 kilometers away. It's a long run. They will actually make it by the end of the battle. They hear that messenger is sent down to them, and they hear, and uh, one of the, it's led by uh, Harald uh, Hardrada's son, and by the time he gets there, the English have defeated his father, his father lies dead. So um, it's a long battle, a very, very long battle. Most medieval battles is only fought till the other side runs, runs away. Norwegians aren't running away, they don't have anywhere to go. So they stay and fight to the last man. Um, in fact, we're told that well after Held Drada is killed and the, the Norwegians have reformed, Tosti is in the middle of them and he commands them still to form up and they do die pretty much to, to a man. And then the Norwegian troops arrive sometime right after that. Uh, so that was a long battle. I mean, Hastings is a long battle too. 
And primarily it's because you, in the Middle Ages you fight until either you or the other side runs away. There's no fighting to the death. And uh, most battles are fought to a standstill. And then one side says, no, we've had enough, we're going. Our Stamford Bridge scenario will be played on this two foot by two foot custom battle board, just like we did in the last video for Fulford Gate. But unlike the last scenario, Stamford Bridge has no turn limit. You heard Professor DeVries explain that this was a fight to the death. Our scenario will be the same. Victory here is going to be determined by which army reaches its breaking point first, and both armies will break if they lose 20 units. This would be a good time to remind you that we are playing the three great battles of 1066 as linked scenarios, so losses among leaders, heroes, and elite Huskarls do carry over from battle to battle. Josh's Viking army took heavy losses in our last game, Fulford Gate, but most of his casualties are replaceable. Both Tostig and King Harald Hardrada survived, but two of his elite Norwegian Huskarls were permanently eliminated. These are cream of the crop troops, so their absence at Stamford Bridge will be felt. The army opposing Josh, led by the new Saxon king Harold Godwinson, is a fresh force from the south. But remember, we still have the Battle of Hastings to fight in a couple of weeks, so any losses that the Saxons suffer today will carry over into that game. Our figures are 6mm Bacchus miniatures based on 20mm square bases. You could play Ravenfeast with any scale figures you like, but 6mm is a particularly good choice for players who have limited table space, limited budgets, or just want to get painted armies on the table in a hurry. The Viking army that you see here cost less than $40 and took me just two weekends to paint. I think a lot of players are interested, but perhaps a bit intimidated by the idea of big battles. We want to show you in this video that you can play big, famous battles of history without a big budget. All three of my Dark Age armies, Saxons, Vikings, and Normans, fit neatly into this plastic box with plenty of room to spare. Now let's talk about the battlefield for Stamford Bridge. The defining feature, of course, is the river with the bridge. The Viking army begins with a small vanguard on the western bank, and most of their force is not yet deployed. I'll allow King Hardrada the opportunity to explain to you how this is going to work for the game. Hi, I'm Josh. I'll be playing King Harold Adrada, fresh from my victory at Fulford Gate. I decided to negotiate with the city of Bjork, and now I am, what did I decide to do? Is just take a leisurely day to sun myself on the, on the banks of the river. So um, the mechanic for this is that I'm in, encamped, and I'm not even deployed on the table. I have to roll to get out of my tents, and I only get one base per turn per camp. I have three camps. So <laughs> depending on how I roll, uh, I, I may not even have a full army. Uh, I just have to hope that I get some good rolls. Today I'll be playing the role of Harold Godwinson, King of the Saxons in England. My mission here at Stamford Bridge is to crush the Viking army under Harold Hardrada, um, because as many of you know, I must hurry and meet the invaders from Normandy, the bastard William. My plan here is to immediately act with as much aggression as I possibly can. We're going to push across the bridge. We're immediately going to take the nearest Viking camp and crush it, cutting off some of their supply. Um, by doing so, it will eliminate a, a spawn point for the Vikings, give us a chance to get our veteran fear to cross and form a line, and from there we'll sweep one flank, driving it into the other, and destroy the Vikings. And then, onward to do the same to William. Our newly arrived Saxon king isn't messing around. He recklessly charges ahead with his elite mounted Huskarls, smashing into the unprepared Viking vanguard near the bridge. All right, and we have a combat. So right, combat. this uh, cavalry, these are mounted Huskarls. They are mighty. That's a hit, I need a two. No save. So that guy will be dead. Um, now I get three attacks. Yep. 
Um, my melee is a three. So I get three attacks at three. One hit. Two hits. Uh, let's see, my armor is a four. Good, good. No problem. Ah, ah. The battle has barely begun and Tony's Huskarls have already stormed the bridge before a proper Viking defense can be established. This opens a clear path directly to the first of three Viking camps. Josh has to use these camps to muster his men to arms. Because remember, historically, the Viking host was totally unprepared for this battle. So much so that many troops didn't have time to don their chainmail. We're representing that in the game by lowering the armor rating of Viking units, so Josh is really on the back foot in this game. With mounted Huskarls barreling towards him, the traitor, Tostig Godwinson, is trying to keep the first Viking camp from being overrun. And then the leader here has taken one wound. He's being attacked twice. Mm -hmm. uh, three is a hit. Swing and a miss. Really bad guy rolling. All right. Toasting is dead. Good. <laughs> He's toast. To toasting is toast. <laughs> that, I mean, that's a horrific die rolling. I mean, <laughs> I lost the first combat to block the bridge. Snitches get I stitches. <laughs> in a poetic bit of symmetry, Tostig Godwinson was also slain in the historical battle of Stamford Bridge. In our version of the battle, two thirds of the Viking army still hasn't even appeared yet, and Josh has already lost one of his camps and the bridge. It's a disastrous start for Harold Hardrada. But early Saxon success has been purchased with a precarious gamble. Tony's elite Huskarls are separated from the rest of his army, which is still struggling to cross the river. And Josh has scattered elements of his vanguard to contest the bridge, including a legendary berserker. Professor DeVries mentioned the story of one Viking warrior who supposedly blocked the bridge and killed some 40 Saxons single-handedly. It's almost certainly a myth, but a damn cool one. Josh's order of battle for this game includes a very well-rated berserker unit to try and capture this bit of uh, historical myth-making. And with Tony's army divided, Josh rallies his legendary berserker to recapture the bridge and block the crossing. He gets two, two attack backs on a four. Okay. First one hits, second one hits. Two attacks. Oh, uh, let's see. My armor is three. Uh, I'm going to miss both of those and be slain. True to form, the Viking berserker cuts down the Saxons swarming the bridge, buying precious time for Josh's army to continue assembling on the far side of the river. Remember, we're using Ravenfeast for our 1066 battles, adapting the free skirmish system for big battles. We'll be sharing that big battle supplement with multiple scenarios for free in the next two weeks. If you're a patron of Little Wars TV, you already have early access to these materials. Ravenfeast is designed to be a beginner-friendly system. Units roll a six-sided die to attack, and then another six-sided die to save if they are hit. Most of the units in this game can only take one hit if they fail their armor save, so things tend to resolve pretty quickly. If you want to learn how to play the game, which again is 100% free, we've already made a great video tutorial that teaches you how to play Ravenfeast in less than 10 minutes. My Berserker unit is dead, but it was not in vain. He held ground for three turns on that bridge and took out 300 Saxons in his death. <laughs> that was pretty sweet, actually. It was, actually. Yeah. For several turns, Josh's lone Berserker unit held the bridge, forcing Tony Saxons to search the riverbank for fords. There's a mechanic in the scenario that gives the Saxon infantry a chance to wade across the river if they can roll a six on a six-sided die. And a few of Tony's units have slowly managed to ford their way across, gaining a foothold on the eastern bank. And the Saxons do need to hurry, because King Harold Godwinson and his surviving Huskarls are under increasing pressure from the assembling Viking host. And now, from the south, 
A horn can be heard in the distance. A 3,000-man Viking relief force is rushing onto the field, fresh from a 20-kilometer forced march. These are exhausted troops, but it's just what the Vikings need to stem the tide. King Harald Hardrada senses the time is right to counterattack, leading the charge himself. King on King, Harold versus Harold. Harold, I call you out, you bastard Saxon, you. <laughs> <laughs> this is Saxon land, Harold. Back to Daneland where you belong. It will be Norway land now. All right. Ah, Harold hits. All right. Harold needs a four. He passes. The battle nice. of the Heralds begins. And Harold <laughs> attacks. He attacks back. He misses. Ah, all right then. Here is Morkar. Um, Morkar hits on a four. He'll hit. Pass. The fight continues, raging along the length of the two shield walls. Hit. Oh. Fail. Oh, oh, yay. Broke the line. All right, now I'm Huskar again. Uh, and we're feared. Hit. I need three. Casualties are mounting on both sides, but it's the Vikings who reach their 50% total losses first, which triggers an army-wide morale test for every surviving unit. Several Viking warrior bands fail, retreating back from the engagement, breaking up Josh's shield wall. Is this the end? Will Hardrada's army now simply melt away? Desperate to hold the line against all odds, the Norwegian king refuses to yield, bellowing orders and wading back into personal combat with the Saxon king, Harold Godwinson. Let's do Harold on Harold combat first. Okay. Ah, uh, Harold, yes. Melee on a five. All right, I need a four. Ooh, a hit. No, I passed the save. Oh, okay. So now it's just to hit back. Hit. He hits. Uh, our armor's a five. We're good. Oh my. All right. Um, then uh, the feared hitting in the flank. We're a three. We won't hit. Next one. That's a raider. Hit on a three. Hit. Fails. But they get an attack. Hit. They will need a three. They save. Um, oh, oh no, they need a two because they have a unit in the flank, but they well, still save. Yeah, and the unit in the flank will attack. Miss. Yes. All right. All right. Um, then here. So I'll attack you in the rear. Okay. Go ahead. So I'll have a rear attack, so I hit. Okay, I'm minus two to my armor then because I'm being attacked in the rear. Um, he's normally a four, so he's a two. He will fail, but he will still get his attack against the king, yeah. which he will roll. He hits the king. The king needs a four. Uh, no, the king needs a three. No, needs a two. Needs a two because okay. he has and I got mighty. Two. All right, so then the king takes the a hit. The king is dead. The king is dead. The king is dead. The king is dead. Oh, hail Hadrada! Take that, Viking scum! Wait. England is saved. I hung out longer than I thought. <laughs> I thought after turn two, I thought, man, okay, that was it. Well fought, sir. Good game, man. Oh, yeah, that was, that was um, brutal. That was a rough game. Going. That was a rough game. Oh, sad day, sad day. I turned from, you know, I had a good victory in the beginning of the week, and then the end of the week just was a total disaster. I, Harold Godwinson, King of Saxon England, by grace of God. Blah, 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 blah. You're dead. Why are you talking? <laughs> that is it. <laughs> I have slain yeah. this scoundrel Viking, secured my legacy in history, and freed England from the scourge of Danish hoodlums. Ugh. It came down to really some critical, critical first two or three turns. Tony made a great decision tactically to charge across the river with his horse, with his mounted Huskarls, which ended up being really good because he blew past 
my frontline defenders really quick and was on top of my camps right away, just wreaking havoc. And that was a complete gamble on my part. It was either going to succeed brilliantly or I was going to lose the battle as a result of that. And there was a point mid-game where I'm like, um, my troops are going to wind up engaging piecemeal and get slaughtered one by one. But fortunately, um, the Some dice gods yeah. smiled and all was well. Yep, some bad rolls and some good tactical decisions. It was a good fight. Well fought, sir. Thanks. We know how the historical battles of Fulford Gate and Stamford Bridge end. Harold Godwinson annihilates the Danish invasion and kills his own treacherous brother. But another contender, Greg, still remains, William, Duke of Normandy. So when William comes into, uh, into Hastings or into the southern coast of Pevensey and then up to Hastings, where he essentially camps thinking that he's now going to have to face the King of England anytime soon. He hears obviously from people around that the King of England has gone north and there's another threat. And that's probably the first time William hears that he in fact now has a landing that's not going to be, that's going to be unhindered. And he can build his camps and he can in fact build a, a castle at, uh, at Hastings which still exists. Next time on Little Wars TV, join us at Hastings for a battlefield tour as we walk this famous ground and discuss the final climax of 1066. Then we'll set up another mini battle board to complete the trilogy and see if our Harold Godwinson can change history and defend his crown from the Norman invasion. A huge thank you to Professor Kelly DeVries for joining us this week on the channel. And if you want to watch bonus video segments from our extensive two-hour interview with one of the world's leading historians on 1066, visit us at littlewarstv.com or join us on Patreon. I besiege thee, St. Stephen, with a rose in and out of the garden he goes, country garden in the wind and the rain, wherever he goes the people all complain. All right. Did you record that? Of course I did. Excellent. We're rolling. <laughs>